the Director of Community Engagement at NASCO, or the North American Students of Cooperation. Um, we're hosting this webinar in collaboration with the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth. Um, Chris, would you like to introduce yourself quickly? Definitely. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Bell, and I am a master's student in urban planning at the University of Waterloo here in Canada. And I also am a regional focal point for North America for UNMGCYs, and that's the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth, uh, their Housing and Sustainable Urban Development Working Group. group. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, we are also very excited to have a fantastic line of lineup of speakers today. Um, first, We'll hear from Nick Revington, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo. Um, and he'll be going through a general background of tenure, youth, young people, and affordability in the North American cities. And Chris, would you mind just switching the slide for me quick? Great, thank you. And then after that, we will hear from the co-founders of an organization called City Hive, Veronica Bill. Liki, I'm sorry, messed up your name, and just Tessica Trong. Um, they will be sharing their insight on youth leadership and civic engagement in Vancouver. And then finally, we will be hearing from Corrigan Nadal Nichols. Um, he is the Director of Development at NASCO here, and he'll be giving an overview of housing co ops serving youth in the US and Canada. Um, so once we hear from all of our speakers, um, we'd also love to hear from you. So we'll be opening up the floor for questions. And if at any point during the webinar, um, if you have any pressing questions, feel free to use the chat feature. Um, it should be on the right side of your screen if you're logged in through a computer. And we'll kind of leave it up to the speakers if they'd like to answer right away or leave it for the, for the end. We'll be taking notes as well. Um, and with that, I think I will pass it off to Nick. Or sorry, to Chris. Hi, everyone. So just a little bit of information about the UN Major Group for Children and Youth. Um, it is the UN General, General Assembly mandated official, formal, and self-organized space for children and youth from birth to age 30 to contribute to and engage in intergovernmental and allied processes. The UNMGCY was formed in 1992 out of the Rio Earth Summit, and we also work to coordinate youth inputs into Habitat 3 and into its outcome document, the New Urban Agenda. And Habitat 3 stands for the third UN Conference on Housing and Sustainable Urban Development, which happened back in 2016 in Quito, Ecuador, and essentially provided a space for the global community to take stock around issues facing uh, urban settlements around the world. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about NASCO, but then Corgan will be also sharing more. Um, but for a brief overview, the North American Students of Cooperation, um, we were formed by student housing co-ops in 1968. Um, our members are comprised from about 50 different co-ops throughout North America, um, from small community-based co-ops to large campus-based co-ops. Um, some of the services that we provide include education. Um, so we every year put on a big conference in November um, called NASCO Institute or NASCO Cooperative Education and Training Institute, which is about 400 co-opers from all over North America who join for a weekend of a lot of workshops and training and community building. And then we also do a conference specifically for staff and managers of co-ops. Um, we also put on a summer internship network where we match students from, or students and non-students alike, um, with different host organizations throughout North America. And we also have a shared resource library on our website, which is free for all to use and it's great to find co-op education resources. And so now just a bit of information on the new urban agenda. Um, and this is relevant um, because of course, part of the impetus for this webinar um, has to do with some of the themes outlined in this outcome document, which is again the outcome of Habitat 3 held back in 2016 in Ecuador. Now this document was adopted by UN member states both at Habitat 3 and endorsed by UN member states through the General Assembly. And essentially what it does in about 60 pages, it outlines global principles and priorities for sustainable urban development over the next 20 years. And this covers a bunch of different concerns, including environmental and land degradation, to the need uh, for better, more rational and comprehensive urban planning. And it also includes the need to 
to promote a diversity of housing tenures, including renting and cooperative housing. And you can find that in paragraph 107. Also, in particular, a need to focus on uh, differentiating between different group population groups, as of course these policies are impacted on different groups and segments of society differently. And also, the new urban agenda ties quite nicely into the sustainable development goals adopted in 2015, including SDG 11, which deals with housing and sustainable and inclusive urban development. Great, and with that, we will just pass it off to Nick Revington, who will be our first speaker today. Great, hi everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today, and thank you to NASCO and uh, the UN Group for Children and Youth for having me. I'm happy to be here. So as uh, Rati introduced me, uh, I am Nick Revington. I'm a PhD candidate at the School of Planning uh, at the University of Waterloo. And I've been asked to provide a little bit of background uh, about, uh, about young adults and housing tenure and affordability in North American cities. So if we could just get the next slide there, Chris. I am a collaborator on a research project called Generation City, which is directed by Dr. Marcus Mose, who is also at the University of Waterloo in the School of Planning. Uh, and there's also other researchers affiliated with the project across Canada uh, and the United States. And the purpose of this project is to consider how age and generation shape society um, in, um, and to understand how different generations experience unique challenges resulting from economic, demographic, so and societal changes. And so to date, this research has focused in particular on young adults or what you might call the, gen the uh, millennial generation. And the aim of the project is to inform public and policy debates through research. So if you look at the graphics here on the slide, um, apologies to those who are joining us by phone, but uh, I'll describe what's there anyway. In the United States, 15% uh, of young adults aged 25 to 35 lived in their parents' home in 2016, which is up from 8% in 1981. We've also seen an increase in young adults living at home in Canada. Um, the, the statistics for a different age group and a, a different time period. But uh, in 2016, 34.7% of young adults aged 20 to 34 were living uh, with at least one parent in 2016, which is up from 30.6% in 2001. Young adults are also more likely to spend more than 30% of their income on housing um, compared to other households in cities across the United States and Canada. So this uh, chart on the left, uh, young adults are, are the red bars and all ages are the blue bars. The five uh, sets of bars on the left are the cities with the most young adults as a percentage of the population and the cities on the right are the cities with the, the smallest proportion of young adults in the population. We can see kind of across the board, it doesn't matter the population makeup, uh, young adults are, are spending more on housing as a percentage of their income. And uh, home ownership rates are also lower in, uh, among young adults in both countries. And so these issues are worrying in part because uh, besides being one way among others of getting shelter, home ownership is also uh, one of the main avenues by which households amass wealth, and that's expected to contribute to household well-being. Um, and it's also viewed, homeownership is often viewed societally as a sign of success. So if I could get the next slide there. It's important to realize that when it comes to young adults' housing issues, they're not due to one single cause, and it's therefore unlikely that there will be one kind of cure-all solution. <clears throat> Changing labor markets are a big piece of the puzzle. There's been a rise in part-time work, contract-based work, and a decline in unionization rates. Um, and income polarization has also increased uh, within the knowledge economy. 
Young adult earnings have also not kept pace with growth overall, leading to a generational wage gap. So on average, young adults earn less than older employees, but this gap has actually increased over time since the 80s. There's also reduced government support for um, social and assisted housing in both Canada and the United States. And the result is that there's a, a reduced supply of dedicated affordable housing that is accessible to young adults. What support there is for social housing in both Canada and the United States tends to be directed towards the elderly. And finally, um, cities where housing is cheap generally have fewer econ economic opportunities and cities where there are more economic opportunities tend to have more expensive housing markets. So it's difficult to just sort of relocate your way out of the problem. All right, next slide, please. So it's not terribly surprising that ownership rates are lower among young adults than they are for uh, the population as a whole, right? It takes time to save up to buy a house and young adults are typically at the start of their career trajectory. So many young adults, <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, spend time in post-secondary education and during this time, they're not really saving up to buy a house. They might actually be incurring debt. Um, the bigger question is whether or not things have gotten worse. Is it getting harder or is it taking longer for young adults to enter home ownership than in the past? And so here we see the home ownership rates over time among young adults and the general population in both the United States and Canada. So home ownership rates in the United States uh, among young adults have actually declined and they've experienced a larger decline than the population as a whole since the mid 2000s. So in a sense, there is inequality between generations in the ability to access home ownership. In contrast, if we look at Canada, the home ownership rate among young adults has continued to increase modestly since the 1990s, exceeding an earlier peak in the early 1980s. However, these aggregate figures don't really tell the full story. So in Canada, um, debt to asset ratios have increased substantially among the youngest cohorts of the population. So intergenerational equity is not absent in Canada, it just manifests, manifests itself differently than it does in the United States. And these aggregate, aggregate figures also conceal considerable inequality within generations and particularly among young adults. So in Canada, again, um, where young adult homeownership rates have actually increased, this increase has been driven almost entirely by higher income households. So in both countries, there is a distinct possibility that for many, homeownership is going to become contingent on having parents who are willing and able to use their resources to help their children buy a house, right? And that might not be the case for everyone. In the United States, African-American homeownership rates have fallen especially fast since the Great Depression or Great Recession, I mean. Um, and in Canada too, the homeownership rate of blacks uh, is far lower than most other ethnic or racial groups. Uh, next slide. One issue haven't, we, we haven't touched on too much yet is housing prices. And here we have indices of house prices in several major urban regions in Canada and the United States. Because these are indices, they're not showing absolute prices, but rather how prices have changed over time. And so the, the big takeaway here is that there's considerable variability between regions. So uh, in Canada, for example, in Vancouver and Toronto, prices have more than doubled since 2005. So those are the, the kind of top two lines at the, at the far right of that graph. Uh, meanwhile, in um, Ottawa and Halifax, prices have only increased by 50%. Those are the bottom two lines uh, of the Canadian graph there. Looking at the United States, in San Francisco and Boston, house prices have more than tripled since 1991. Meanwhile, uh, in Cleveland and Detroit, uh, there have been far more modest increases, net increases over the same period. And so this means that there's also considerable regional inequality in young adults' ability to access and benefit from home ownership. So in regions where prices are increasing substantially, 
young adults, and especially those with lower incomes, may be unable to afford homeownership and are therefore less likely to benefit from the price appreciation of their homes um, as older generations have done and as their wealthier peers may be able to do. In other places where housing is more affordable, um, young adults might be able to access home ownership, but they might not experience uh, those increasing home values that uh, young adults in other parts of uh, either of the countries may do. In places where that are experiencing economic decline, the main young adults might actually be made worse off um, through home ownership if the, if the um, value of their home declines. And uh, next slide, please. So to return to the question posed by the title of this webinar, is home ownership dead? My answer is a no, but. So no, because it is still the dominant tenure in North America numerically, but also ideologically in the notion of the American dream and the notion of the Canadian dream um, and in government policies that support home ownership over other tenures. There's no conclusive indication that declining home ownership rates among young adults are a major substantial long-term trend, even if they might be lower right now. For many young adults, there may be a delay in entering home ownership, and there may be modest declines in overall home ownership rates in the long term, uh, remains to be seen, but a widespread conscious rejection of or permanent exclusion of or exclusion from home ownership uh, is, is unlikely for most. But that said, there are important inequalities that need to be addressed. There will always be those young adults for whom home ownership is neither advantageous nor attainable, um, and they need support as well. Focusing exclusively on home ownership risks diverting attention from other issues such as young adult homelessness. So the Washington Post, for example, um, recently reported that one in 10 young adults in the United States have been homeless at some point over the past year. And so these are major issues. Um, but I'm going to leave it to the other speakers to discuss potential solutions to these issues. Um, that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nick. Um, and we've had a couple people join um, since we started here. Just want to let you know, um, you can feel free to jot down questions. We'll be keeping track of them um, for questions and answers at the end. But welcome. Uh, we'll also have a recording of this as well. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Jessica and Veronica um, from City High. There you go. Perfect. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Traum. And, and I'm Veronica Bleepke. And we're both the co-founders and co-directors of City Hive, um, which is an organization on a mission to transform the way that young people are engaged in the planning, design, and shaping of their cities. Um, for context, we're working in Metro Vancouver. Um, and, but I think that a lot of the challenges and the issues that are, are here are um, very spread throughout Canada, but also um, throughout North America. So I think that there's a lot um, that we can share from the work that we, we've been doing here and learning from other cities from, uh, as well. Uh, so, next slide. Um, so to take a bit of a step back, um, City Hive, big picture, um, acts as a bridge building organization between um, cities and city shaping institutions um, that have these ambitious goals to become the greatest city in the world, to, um, to engage and, and tackle issues around homelessness and affordability, um, but need to have the community on board in terms of ownership, uh, leadership, and stewardship of these issues. And on the flip side, we have young people that are often um, really passionate, have a lot of energy and excitement, and a lot of knowledge about these issues, but are just looking for ways to, um, to connect and to have an impact in those, so those communities. And so we have, City Hive really works with both those um, both youth and both the cities and civic organizations to help path, create pathways and bridges between those um, those areas. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And so when we, we launched City Hive just over a year ago now, and when we were planning our first project, we didn't have to look too far and wide to decide which issue we wanted to hone in on. Um, and of course, that was housing, which has been the hot topic 
um, in Vancouver for many years, as it has been in many of the cities that you're in as well, and the ones that you were just speaking about, Nick, too. Um, and there's been this this narrative about about young people and about millennials and housing, and really how we're victims of this housing crisis. Um, and there's been amazing research and work done to support that. And we really wanted to take that and use that and shift that conversation um, to be with and by millennials. Um, and especially this kind of narrative that's, that's coming up about millennials being apathetic or not caring and not showing up um, or wanting to buy avocado toast instead of um, wanting to own a home or being able to own a home. And so we really, really wanted to uh, shift that narrative. And so we planned a project called the 30 Network. Next slide. And the 30 Network uh, was a pop-up think and do tank. It took place over three months. Um, and essentially it was an innovation process where we selected 30 under 30 um, from across Metro Vancouver to collaborate and work together on uh, projects to launch um, to address the housing and affordability crisis. Um, and so we selected 30 individuals that were um, not housing policy nerds because we knew that if we convened 30 people who had been heavily involved in housing issues that those conversations were already taking place and we were a part of those in, in a different way. But we really wanted to convene young people that had been affected by the housing crisis and um, and who had different areas of knowledge and expertise to come in together and work on these projects. So we had engineers, health professionals, fashion designers, artists who are trying to survive in the city, um, students and, and all sorts of different people between the ages of um, 18 to 30. Uh, next slide. And to make this happen, we brought on board a variety of different partners who've all been working in the um, in the space of housing for um, for decades. Some of them, so from our local financial institution and credit union, Van City, um, national organizations like City for People, Generation Squeeze, um, and other organizations, the City of Vancouver, um, who all had a stake in the conversation, so that any project that emerged from the process weren't just floating around and looking for a place to have an impact but so that all of the projects and initiatives that emerged from the process um, could be as high impact and um, relevant and, um, and ready to launch as possible. Next slide. So in terms of what the process actually looks like, um, over the course of these three months, uh, first we, we, um, we did a deep dive and learned about where are we at and we learned about the landscape, the housing landscape, what was happening in the city, more about the issue, and then also what was already being done by different stakeholders uh, around the city. Um, and I think what was really important during that process was that um, all 30 of our, our 30 networkers, they went out and interviewed folks so that they learned more about not just their lived experiences, but the lived experiences of others um, in this under 30 age category. Um, and the, the second part was also with the next step of visioning what would an ideal housing situation look like in the future. So not trying to just figure out in incremental steps for improving the process, but ultimately where would we want to end up? And then from there, we were able to build back and look at, come up with hundreds and hundreds of creative solutions um, to, to, to address and to build towards this ideal vision of an affordable Vancouver. And from that, we narrowed down to the projects that folks were really excited about, had passion, and had um, the knowledge um, that, to be able to really implement them on the ground. And so from this four month process, or sorry, this three month process, um, we were able to launch six different projects um, from these 30, 30. And Veronica can talk a little bit more about the projects that emerged. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. So um, out of these six projects and uh, the voting process that took place at our public event where we had um, judges and the public vote on which project they think should receive seed funding. Um, we had one, the one project that won that seed funding was called Empty Nest. Um, and so it's an intergenerational paired living program where um, they're creating an online platform that would connect seniors um, or empty nesters who maybe have their kids move out um, or who live alone and have empty space at home, um, pairing them with younger folks who are looking for more affordable housing options. So um, kind of killing two birds with one stone in that it's addressing affordability, um, but also social isolation, which actually in Metro Vancouver has been voted um, the top issue above housing is social connectedness and isolation. Um, another project to highlight is uh, Community Pop or Co-Pop, where they're working with a research group out of UBC that was mapping underutilized space in Vancouver, so empty lots, 
um, spaces that hadn't been used for years um, and looking at how they could create uh, temporary um, housing options. So things like tiny homes, for example. And so they're working with Tiny Homes BC, which is um, advocating to make um, tiny homes legal in municipalities across BC because they're actually, they don't meet the building codes and the bylaws. So tiny homes right now aren't legal in Vancouver, although they are in a few different municipalities, but not in most. Um, and then the other projects um, were advocacy oriented um, or oriented to engaging more youth in housing issues um, or a platform, for example, um, was about providing more um, long-term options for people who work in the creative industry and who have to take contracts in different cities so that they um, are able to keep their places in one city and trade houses with other creatives who are traveling around the community. So all six of the projects were quite different and they're all in a very different place um, right now after the 30 Network. Next slide, please. So building on this work, and uh, Veronica also mentioned that two of the projects um, were kind of housed or, or um, under um, existing organizations. And so Generation Squeeze was one of the organizations that was a key partner um, for us in terms of uh, being able to support the 30 network, but also moving forward building um, and building a long-term campaign, the Code Red campaign, um, on engaging young people to come speak out uh, about the housing issue crisis and, and to influence policy change. Um, and so Generation Squeeze, much too, I think, what Nick was sharing earlier, talks about how our generation, so Canadians in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, and I'm sure this is also applicable um, to folks in, in America, are tripled squeezed by one, rising student debt, two, increasing costs, um, living costs, whether it's transportation, housing, childcare, um, all of those are packed together. And then third, a third of all, um, a lower income when you graduate or when you're finding your first job compared to previous generations. And so that triple squeeze really puts us in and sets us up as young Canadians and young North Americans uh, to be disadvantaged um, in terms of our starting point, uh, um, social and economically. So we've been doing some work with them. Um, and Veronica will share a little bit more about one of uh, some of the work that we've been doing around building civic engagement um, with young people participating and speaking out about housing issues. Next slide. So one of the projects that we ran was around the Housing Vancouver strategy. So the city of Vancouver itself was creating a new um, affordable housing strategy essentially for the next, and a plan for the next 10 years of how they're going to address the housing crisis. Um, and so at, in the creation of that strategy, we ensured as much as possible that young voices were being represented in the creation of it and in the consultation processes leading up to it. Um, and this past November, the strategy was going to city council to be passed. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that there were lots of young voices at that city council meeting and leading up to it saying that, yes, this is something that we need to see through. And in case there's any opposition, that there would be enough young voices out in support of it, or at least showing up and saying these are the pieces of the strategy that we want to see prioritized and these are our stories. And so we um, organized a training session for folks to come out, learn about the housing strategy, for us to kind of break down this big 250 page document into something that was um, a little bit more in, in bite-sized pieces and comprehensible, um, and to also learn how to speak at city council. And originally we planned this event to be in like a small room for 10 people to show up and learn. Um, and in just a few hours, we already had over 50 people signed up and ultimately we had um, over 100 people sign up and 70 people show up um, saying that they wanted to learn how to speak at city council and, and they in general wanted to show up and speak about how uh, important this was for them. Mm -hmm. And so we, we had this training um, and then the city council meeting happened and we had um, a number of young people show up and, and speak, share their stories of housing um, in Vancouver. And um, and ultimately, the strategy, the strategy, the strategy passed, and it's now, um, I guess, now is where the real work begins and continues. Mm -hmm. okay. But it was a real testament to the fact that often when we when we put out the invitation for young people to come and show up to city council, it can happen at you know maybe I don't know how it is in your city, but I know in Vancouver, city council meetings are usually in the middle of the day on Wednesday or on Tuesday, and how many people can actually miss school or skip work to show up to a city council meeting and speak in support of something um, as important as this. And so we wanted to make it really, we wanted to extend that invitation and kind of walk people's hands through that process. And I think 
it was a testament to the fact that when you when you extend that invitation and you make it really easy to engage and participate, people do show up. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And so this was really a huge experiment in one building civic literacy and then also two in translating the policy document that we had been involved with uh, over the course of the year in its in its creation and through consultation process, but that ultimately none of us had seen this policy document mm -hmm. until like a, a week before. So being able to translate like a hundred page document to the public and share this is these are the highlights and this is why we think it actually helps us, helps our generation, um, and, and here are the things where they could be doing more. Yeah. Uh, next slide. So I think ultimately these examples of the work that we've been doing with Generation Squeeze and the, this education program and then also the 30 network um, on housing and affordability are examples of the work that we, we, we do and examples of how bringing community together to, to learn about the expertise and the lived experiences of young people in the city can really um, can really transform the challenges and reframe challenges into opportunities. Um, and so that there's a huge opportunity for us to really be to working to be working with youth and engaging better youth um, in in um, civic decisions. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And so really another way of framing that too is this triple win, the fact that by engaging youth more meaningfully in addressing um, these big complex urban challenges, which in part of course um, it's not to say that we're trying to make put the put the onus on youth to be solving these challenges in these positions that they're that uh, where they're victims of the challenges as well, but really that it is it does take all stakeholders, citizens, government, private sector, all sorts of different organizations to be using their resources um, and to be leveraging their expertise in order to, to solve the challenges together. And um, by leveraging the expertise and lived experiences of youth, we're creating these triple wins where. We're creating um, opportunities for meaningful community engagement, building more engaged civic leaders, but also providing solutions for cities um, now and ultimately for future cities too. Excellent. And that is all. If you'd like to keep in touch, of course, or if you have any questions, we're looking forward to hearing those or feel free to get in touch with us after as well. Thank you so much for having us on this webinar. Great. Thank you so much, Jessica and Veronica. Um, and finally, we're just going to hear from Corrigan Nato Nichols from NASCO. All right. Hello. Looks like I am here. Uh, hi, my name is Corrigan Nato Nichols, and I'm the Director of Development at NASCO. Uh, our office is in Chicago, and we're uh, membership association of co-ops around the U.S. and Canada, as Rati mentioned at the top of this uh, webinar. Um, yeah, and I've been working for this uh, organization for about five years, and I also lived in a housing co-op here in Chicago for about 10 years. Um, so yeah, let's see, you can go on to the next slide. Okay, so um, kind of coming at this from thinking about like what what are the housing needs of, of youth uh, and younger adults who are on their own? Um, what makes this different than what's out in the housing market? Why, why is this as something that needs to be talked about uniquely? Um, and I think uh, from the perspective of our work with people living in housing co-ops and wanting to start housing co-ops and people who contact us um, trying to find solutions for their housing needs, um, there's a few kind of uh, key needs that I think cluster together around people based on uh, an age, but also can apply to other groups, and that relates to the cooperative housing as a solution. Um, so one is uh, people who are looking for housing for a small household, uh, single adults, uh, maybe a couple of adults who are in a relationship, or an adult and a child, um, a small number of people, you don't need a, a big house or an apartment as have often traditionally been built for the nuclear family or the extended family with two, three, four, five bedrooms and so forth. Um, people who are not looking for a long-term commitment to their housing, or at least can't necessarily commit to being somewhere for five years. Uh, they might be in school, they might be looking around for different jobs, they might be in a fluid uh, work or career environment, um, or they might need to move to another city. Um, or even just different parts of within a city uh, can can offer different opportunities. 
um, uh, people who don't have the money to invest in purchasing a property, uh, obviously, and we were the we we're talking. Nick was talking about that with um, the equity and wealth that people are able to accumulate earlier in life, and issues with the you know wage stagnation and and income inequality as kind of larger economic trends. Um, the needs for connect being near various amenities, uh, you know, walkability has become a more prominent term in real estate, and I put walkable there or bikeable or drivable, but. Uh, I think some people have a greater need to be near several different locuses, uh, work and school and recreation, a need to meet people, to be outside and do things. Um, their life maybe has not consolidated into a smaller number of points of reference that, that they're coordinating with or something where uh, commuting in and out of, of a city uh, makes sense for them. Um, and the, the fifth one, I think, is the, the need for connections to community and social function. I was really interested to hear in Vancouver that a survey turned up social isolation as a number two issue um, for people. And I see that as a very strong need that drives a lot of young people towards interest in, uh, in housing co-ops. And something that current housing stock is not necessarily built around providing community space, social space, uh, ways to connect with your neighbors, ways to share things with your neighbors. Um, it's it's designed for an isolated consumer to buy and sell or rent a you know the ideal is for your unit to be as isolated as possible you're not going to hear your neighbors smell your neighbors have to like deal with your neighbors Amazon packages I you know that's that's kind of the ideal and and we make uh, concessions in a city to have multi-unit buildings but actually there's uh, a value there that people want to have those opportunities to connect uh, next slide um, so yeah, I, some of these challenges, I think, identify the, the flip side of those needs. Um, housing displacement and insecurity, the rental market being the place where most young adults have traditionally looked for housing if you, if you aren't able to buy housing. And that means you don't have a guarantee about the cost of your housing. You don't have guarantee about the availability of the housing because the building could be sold, demolished, converted, uh, turned over in various ways. Um, you are in a market where you're negotiating for the price and quality of your housing and perhaps that's coming up every year when your lease renews or if you have to move and the the power in that relationship between the renter and the landlord often favors the the landlord um, in those negotiations and in particular people moving to a new area might not be able to know all the tricks or the ins and outs of, of how to get a reasonable deal and we see that a lot in, especially in student uh, uh, dominated neighborhoods that student renters are not as savvy and as have as much power in negotiating for quality or price of their housing. Um, uh, we've talked about a little bit earlier here about housing shortages and uh, demand in some of the urban centers that we have become primary hubs of tech and uh, high growth industries, uh, where an area where there's kind of a uniform housing demand and supply suddenly, boom, right here, everyone wants to be there and prices triple in the course of five or 10 years. Um, lack of community space and interaction, the types of units that are available for young adults and the flexibility as your family changes and you're going through different changes like that. Uh, obviously the generic solution a lot of people have to the size mismatch issue is roommates. It's very, you know, it's the typical thing of young adults. You rent a house or an apartment, you get two or three or four other roommates, um, but pretty much everyone has some kind of horror story of uh, living with roommates and people not doing dishes or people doing things at all hours of the night. Um, these informal house sharing arrangements are always meant to be temporary and a lot of people are dissatisfied with them or are looking forward to when they cannot have roommates because of those issues. Um, so there's that as a solution of, for saving money is not, not necessarily a, a good solution for everyone long term. Uh, next slide. Um, so some of, the, some of the trends I think were also mentioned here. I think the big one really that needs to be out there is stagnant wages, inflation adjusted since about the 1970s really, uh, as far as US wage data that I'm aware of, um, which goes hand in hand with increasing wealth concentration and disinvestment of governments in social housing and, and social services. Uh, really all of these things, uh, the triple squeeze that the previous presenters were speaking about, I think all of those issues do stem from uh, the, I think the neoliberal economic tradition that has 
uh, been pushing more things towards the private market uh, and where uh, private wealth ownership has able to kind of use that to capitalize on political structures that were uh, providing broader services. And so that's a bigger issue, but I think uh, things like the generational equity gap and uh, disparate impacts on uh, different racial groups, all of these things uh, shouldn't be, igno uh, we shouldn't forget the larger context of, of how those things are coming, uh, getting fed over the last 70 years by different policy choices. Um, so public housing support and also SROs and boarding houses as a model of, of housing, I think has fallen out of favor and had less, less public investment as well. Um, and many of those have been decommissioned and knocked down, especially in the last 10 or 15 years in various cities. Uh, next slide. Uh, so housing co-ops, I don't know how many people on the call are familiar with housing cooperatives. Um, so I'll just give a quick overview of what they are and what they offer. Um, it's a residential property that's owned by a cooperative corporation, which is a type of uh, corporation that's controlled by its users and not by investors or a government agency. So each member has a unit of vote or share in control of the corporation. Um, and that's a business model that's used for lots of different businesses and it can be used to own housing uh, as well as, as other things like grocery stores and retail stores and utilities and all that. Um, to become part of a housing cooperative, residents purchase initial member shares. There's one upfront fee, which can be transferred or refunded depending how the co-op set up. And you also pay some monthly recurring charges to cover the ongoing operating costs and mortgage costs of the property. Uh, typically the member share is low enough that you aren't getting your own mortgage for your share, uh, but the co-op itself has one big loan, one big mortgage for the whole, whole overall property. Um, and these can be multi-unit properties, it can be a shared house or rooming house type property, it can be row houses, detached houses, there's all kinds of different form factors there. Um, the housing cooperative, as with other corporations, is governed by a board of directors who are, in this case, elected by the residents, that's the element of control there, uh, which set policies, budgets and rates, and often will hire a management company or their own service staff to provide uh, property management and support for the properties to various extent. Uh, extent. Uh, next slide. Um, in particular, so NASCO uh, was started by uh, associate groups of housing co-ops that were serving students and were started by students. Um, and I think this has been kind of our niche that's grown both in terms of the model of cooperative housing we support and develop and who's been continued interested in, in having those needs that expand uh, the use of co-ops. Uh, so uh, I, to back up a little bit, there's, um, you know, something like somewhere between 250 and 400,000 housing co-ops in the United States. And I think there is somewhere around 50,000, 20 to 50,000 um, housing co-ops in Canada. Um, and there's associations, uh, Canadian Housing, uh, uh, Canadian Federation of Housing Co-ops. Um, and the National Association of Housing Co-ops in the US. So there's kind of a larger field of housing co-ops that, that follow this, but in particular thinking about the needs of youth and young adults, um, co-ops which uh, have a different form factor and better meet some of those needs that we spelled out in the first slide, including smaller units, such as just a single bedroom unit or a bedroom in a bathroom or a studio apartment uh, and having more shared space. So more shared bathrooms, shared kitchens, shared living space and storage space. Uh, having space for community meetings, recreation, parties, um, having other shared services and household things built in. So maybe there's shared bulk food purchasing, uh, which can save people 20 or 30 percent on food costs if they if they purchase together um, and even shared meal preparation. If there's a shared kitchen and you have a rotating meal schedule, then you're saving even more money by having more home cooked food and less less take, uh, you know, take out or uh, commercially prepared food. Um, sharing of household chores that, to the extent that you have some of the shared space which reduce the individual cost for a person, you do have the need to maintain and upkeep those, those shared spaces, uh, which um, can lead to shared chores, which also then translates out with not having costs of janitorial uh, and maintenance staff to the same levels that you would in, in most rental housing um, and can, can be a net saving over private or even publicly owned rental housing. Um, and another, I think, benefit and uh, kind of design element of 
housing co-ops that that primarily work with NASCO is uh, making educational opportunities about cooperatives and economic democracy built into it. So you're making people go to meetings anyways because they have to be in charge of the co-op and you're making them do chores and work together and share things. Uh, they have to do that anyway, so let's do it well and let's learn about um, you know why this thing is a co-op, what the benefit of a co-op is, how that compares to other models and how this interacts with some of the larger social and economic issues that people are facing. Uh, next slide. Uh, so yeah, how do you start a housing co-op if anyone's interested in this uh, for themselves uh, or as a policy position uh, to make more opportunities for this? Um, you know, housing co-ops have started by lots of different people over time. There's, It's been supported financially or uh, kind of technically by different government and cities over time. So whole history of that, of a lot of the co-ops in the US and Canada have various stories of how it got going, but in general, it looks something like this, that there has to be some group of people to get together and talk about their shared needs. Um, it's, it's really good when it's coming from the people who need the housing and it's not something that you just try to drop down and say like, oh, people need housing, let's throw some money at that problem. I mean, it's nice, it's nice if someone's willing to throw money at the problem, but uh, it doesn't necessarily create um, the grassroots democracy that sustains a co-op. Uh, that forming group needs to build alliances and partnerships, needs to reach out to other municipal groups, uh, um, private nonprofit groups that support that and, and business community lenders, all of that um, to find some of the resources to pull together because the theory here is not all the people are coming in with their own pile of money because if they had their own pile of money, they could buy their own building. Uh, to start with, um, making the plan, putting together the budget, the feasibility, which can be uh, yeah, the financial plan of how you're going to operate, also figuring out zoning issues, construction design issues, can you use existing buildings, can you modify buildings, uh, are you trying to acquire things, how's that going to work? Um, then there's a stage of actually creating the formal cooperative organization, incorporating that business, um, and, and creating the rules for that process, which involves a lot of fleshing out how is this community going to work together democratically to manage their own property um, now that they've uh, shed the weight of of the uh, landlord or larger institution that, that would have otherwise managed the, pro the, the housing for them. Uh, and then you get into finding the site for a property, uh, which varies from whether you're trying to acquire existing uh, residential property or design or build something from scratch or, or renovate something. Um, so site selection, uh, architectural design, all of that, getting that together. And then you get the money together, you get the agreements together. Uh, and that's, you know, trying to pretend like, oh, that's just one little thing that happens so quickly. Um, but there's obviously a, a, a lot that happens there to get all the agreements for lending. There might be grants, subsidies, uh, and various streams of money to come together. Um, but it is something that you can pull together as a community effort um, with with some work and then you have a co-op you have some fun you move in and you have housing which is going to be affordable and controlled by the residents and able to meet those community needs in an ongoing way um, and, and not subject to kind of the the whims and fluctuations that the the public or the you know the, the privately owned housing market uh, can bring to bear uh, so I think that next slide is the last one. Yep, uh, that's my contact info, email, phone number, website, Twitter, all that stuff. Happy to talk to anybody about specific projects you might be looking to work on or start um, or other information about co-ops. So thanks for uh, bringing me on board here. And I'll hand it back to the uh, moderator. Great, thanks Corgan. Um, and at this time, I'd like to invite all of the speakers to actually turn their video and um, back on, maybe hold off on audio for now. And it's time to hear from you, all of the attendees here in the room. Um, if you have questions, we have a wonderful panel, people who can answer them. Um, feel free to go ahead and use video or audio if you're comfortable with that. If you prefer just to use the chat function, we're keeping your eyes on that as well. Um, so far, I don't believe there are any questions that have come in. Um, so I'll just give you some time to think about that. 
Um, and in the meantime, while you're thinking of questions, we do have a couple questions prepared for this lovely panel. And I'm just gonna put them out on the floor. The first one is, how did you first become interested in and involved with housing issues? <laughs> Um, I can jump in there and maybe both of us can jump in too. Um, I know for me, and I think for you as well, um, uh, it's a, quite a personal issue. And I know I, I grew up in, in co-op housing actually and lived in co-op housing my entire life. Um, and as I was growing up, there were a lot of proposals for my neighborhood to change and transform. It became a transit corridor. Um, and all of a sudden there were proposals for um, very different forms of housing. and. Um, not a lot of opportunities for community input into what that looks like. And so as a young person, I became really interested in who decides what our communities look like and what they're designed to be and started to attend a lot of open houses and community consultations um, and found that I was often the youngest person in the room, if not by a few decades most of the time. Um, and so that really got me thinking um, and interested in the idea of um, participatory design, but also um, housing and how we can create the right types of housing and the right forms of housing that are within reach and attainable for um, not just young people but different members of the community and have kind of been doing this work ever since then. Mm -hmm. I think uh, yeah a lot of common, common analogies with Veronica's story. Um, I think mostly it became a really personal issue to me like this past these past couple of years where a lot of our friends have either moved away um, or have moved further out and have really been physically pushed out of the city or are in um, precarious living situations. Um, a term and a concept that we we really worked with um, in the 30 network was the idea of this hidden homeless of folks that um, while they weren't necessarily on the street, they were living at, you know, at friends on their couches or out of their cars or kind of in um, perhaps um, unsafe situations with a partner that they had no longer um, wanted to be in the situations, but because of housing reasons, um, we're forced to live in, in those types of situations. And so for us, really, it was a, a really personal issue and, and a desire to do something about it and not to be talked about in the news, in the media without really having a chance for us to also weigh in and, and to talk about the solutions. Because for many folks that were living in Vancouver and staying in Metro in Vancouver, folks had already figured out some sort of creative solution to stay in the city. And so if we could find out ways to really amplify and give a platform to those solutions that worked well um, and put some resources and time and energy um, behind them to, to basically be able to spread some of these solutions to folks, not just to young people, but also um, to all metro Bay careers. I guess I can take that question next. Um, so I, I actually became interested in housing issues kind of a, a roundabout way. I was actually, uh, Doing my doing my master's degree in urban geography, and I was interested in in um, social social equity issues around um, transportation, actually, and um, kind of got looking at the link between uh, transportation and um, gentrification and housing affordability issues, and, and as uh, as Veronica was mentioning, kind of how sometimes uh, urban change is particularly pronounced. Uh, along major transit corridors. And so I started finding myself more interested in the housing side of, of that question than, than the transportation side. And um, so when I, I um, met uh, Dr. Mose, who's my supervisor and who leads the Generation City Project, I met, uh, met him at a conference and um, he's, he's telling me about this Generation City Project and um, it, it kind of really I mean, I could relate to it. I'm I'm a millennial, right? Um, and and so, you know, kind of looking at my own housing prospects and and the situations of my friends, it was just something that, yeah, like this is I can relate to this on a personal level. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I I got involved in this work somewhat accidentally because I uh, moved into a housing co-op um, after college and I had dropped out of grad school and didn't know what I was doing with my life. Um, and it was a, a affordable and community oriented option uh, in the city. And through participating 
through living in a housing co-op uh, that was kind of small scale and very member run, I had a lot of opportunities to learn about how all of this works and got, I think I got interested in that and seeing the ability of housing co-ops to kind of transform people's lives and um, provide something that wasn't being provided anywhere else. Great, thank you all for answering that. Um, hopefully all of our attendees have had some time to think of some really awesome hard questions for our speakers. Um, I'm gonna open the floor up to you now. Sounds like we have some background noise if anyone is about to ask a question, go ahead. We actually have a question just coming in from Maya. Maya asks, how difficult would it be to mandate cooperatives as a percentage of new film, um, presumably by fighting? Um, Chris, I think you're cutting in and out a little bit, at least on our end. If you could repeat that question, that would be fabulous. Sorry about that. I'll repeat the question. How difficult would it be to mandate cooperatives as a percentage of new housing built? And that question is from Maya, and I presume that's for uh, as a percentage of new housing built by private developers. Um, I have, I have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, one is the question of if you are forcing a private developer to make cooperative housing, how effective is that um, cooperative and does it have what it needs to succeed? Um, we have models of condominium development, which in some ways is uh, similar to, to cooperative housing, but it uh, doesn't have some of the affordability, long-term affordability restrictions that are put in. Um, so if it was something that looked fairly similar to that, um, that is something that uh, has basically only been done when there are subsidies being given for that development as well. Um, on, on the other side of it, I think uh, similar efforts would be things to give tenants some kind of uh, ability or right to make to purchase their housing, um, which can lead to cooperatives. Um, so if uh, someone wants to build a rental property, they can, but uh, they have to give the tenants the right to try to buy it if they ever try to sell it in the future. Um, so that's a policy thing that I have seen. Um. I think we can answer from like, uh, what we've seen as the Vancouver housing strategy, and um, they don't necessarily have uh, a piece on it specific to co-ops, but from what we've seen in a similar parallel um, with this emphasis that we have on rental here in the city, um, the city has certain goals and targets that they have in terms of the percentage that they would like to be built. So that's rental, that's multi room that's different different um, aspects and, and related tied to income as well so tied to different income brackets um, but there's a cha challenge between setting a goal and setting a target and then actually getting that built on the ground because often it isn't municipalities that have a lot of funding um, often it isn't cities that are building these themselves um, in the city of Vancouver we often have land that we can offer to different um, social housing or affordable housing projects and that's the way that the city leverages their existing assets to be able to incentivize different things. And as Corgan mentioned, I think there are certain subsidies or um, incentives that they do to kind of incentivize building a rental. And so I'm, I, I'm thinking that there's a similar parallel that could happen in terms of co-op housing. Um, but I think the, the real strength of co-op housing is the fact that people kind of are coming together and, 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 and I don't know whether that can be kind of forced from the top or, or kind of mandated. And so there, there are additional I think, complications or challenges um, around uh, just mandating a certain minimal, minimal level of co-op housing. 
Um, but I do know that the, and Veronica, you could probably speak to this as well, um, for a long time in Canada, at least, the federal government was funding a lot of social housing, a lot of cooperatives. Um, and a while back, that funding was cut. So that funding is no longer existed in Canada. And that, um, there is a certain building stock and a certain kind of, there, there are co-op communities that, that exist all across, across Canada that were initially funded through um, the federal government. Um, and that funding, at the moment at least, it, um, it hasn't, been reduced. hasn't been reduced. I, um, yeah, just to, to echo uh, points made by Tessica and uh, Veronica. Um, yeah, I think I think a, a better approach probably is, is rather than mandating uh, certain percentages of, of different tenures is to just um, make the, the possibility available for those who want to pursue it themselves, right? Um, the, the federal government in Canada, I can't speak to the US, but in, in Canada has um, lately has not uh, supported um, cooperative housing and has not also has not supported um, private rental housing either. Um, the, the federal policy landscape has been very much oriented towards home ownership right? and the, the decline in rental housing construction is, is directly tied to um, a policy change that closed a tax loophole that essentially made it um, not worth developers' time to, to build rental housing, to build, the, it made it more profitable to build um, like your, your classic single detached house or condominium towers. I, I would say uh, there's a tremendous amount of government money subsidizing real, real estate development from federal to state and provincial to city levels, um, from tax side to direct funding to uh, uh, guarantees on loans that reduce rates and guarantees on loans for home buyers and condominium buyers. So in some ways, there's a huge amount of money and policy already being pushed towards the housing market. And when it gets more or less pushed in one way or the other, then that can slide things around. So um, in some ways, cooperative and social housing and democratically controlled housing loses out because it doesn't have that voice. Um, because it, it often is like maybe a little under the radar or a little, uh, you know, comfortable because it's got its own thing going on. Um, and so I think that's raising the profile of those as possibilities um, and just not having having uh, those issues be vacant from discussions about where the governments are going to throw their money because they're already throwing money at, at various forms of real estate and residential housing. Absolutely, and I think that was what we saw within like, with the work that we saw digging deeper into some of the city of Vancouver's housing policies that it actually prevented tiny homes, it prevented five unrelated people from living together in the same uh, single family home. And so while that was happening in the city anyways, um, whether that was illegal or illegal, that was very common. Um, so what we're trying to do is just to kind of incentivize changes in policies that not just encourage, but at least prevent some of these alternative forms of housing like co-housing like cooperative housing, like tiny homes, to, to actually be a possibility to be an option for folks if they wanted to pursue that. Um, and then I think what you're talking about, the next step, how do we incentivize more of these democratically owned and controlled um, forms of housing? Great. Um, I'm wondering, Chris, have any other questions come in through the chat that I'm not seeing? So we did get a follow-up uh, question and comment from Maya, which I'll just read out to you all just for, for your sake. So acquiring the housing um, land, I'm presuming for, for co-ops, um, is a very significant issue. However, the home's quality is also important for long-term value of the investment. As someone who works in weatherization, I am interested to hear if any of you speakers uh, have seen weakening or stronger recommendations regarding construction quality or insulation. We see, for example, a lot of cheap housing getting thrown up and then within a decade, it needs major measures to make it safe slash efficient. Yeah. 
instead of doing this, I'm trusting God that your destiny will change. Right. I'm not sure if that was someone asking a question, but I think we should just go ahead and answer the question that was um, put out about construction recommendations. I apologize for the slew of Vancouver oriented um, kind of policy that's, that's our area of familiarity. Um, not necessarily just specifically to the, the quality of construction, but in the city of Vancouver, there's been increasingly stringent um, policy about green building codes so that all new green um, buildings after a certain date have to be to meet a certain lead standard. And that's kind of like the, the um, within the jurisdiction of the municipalities to um, to be able to enforce. And what we've found is that um, now they're now we're starting to talk about the I guess the confluence between um, increasing like, insulation and increasing the quality of homes with also where that conversation intersects with affordability as well because I think often there's a perception that if the building is uh, more sustainable if the building um, is newer it is going to be ex more expensive um, and certainly that um, to an extent that is true up front but in terms of the long-term operational costs um, if you know and the long-term cost of the house can um, uh, it maintain its value or it doesn't need to be built over again in the long term, there are, there are definitely trade-offs in terms of affordability that we find later on in terms of energy, in terms of water, and in terms of also like renovations and things like that. And so um, I don't know necessarily yet whether there's a, a more holistic um, kind of mechanism to, to incorporate uh, the long-term costs and the trade-offs of, of, of doing cheap construction that might be more affordable on, on the surface, um, but in the long term has a lot more costs and, and impacts on human health and folks that are living in it in its later years, and especially because those are often folks that have, are from lower social economic class or have less um, housing in, insecurity, or sorry, have, have, are more housing insecure. And so um, I don't know if I'm entirely answering your question, but I think that we need to be increasingly talking about the consequences of those, those different areas in terms of like building quality and the longevity of these buildings, um, the affordability, and then also the sustainability of the buildings as well, and how much energy, how much water um, they use. Um, an interesting thing I've seen with housing co-ops and how it shifts around the incentives is that uh, with in a housing co-op where the residents are essentially in a similar to like a rental type relationship, they don't expect to be there a few years. Uh, it doesn't make sense for you to invest heavily in energy efficiency if you're not going to get the benefits over. It might take seven to 15 years to recoup that or like solar panels. Um, but with a housing co-op where those costs can be amortized uh, through the loan and where there's solidarity amongst the members and the future members there, uh, people are much more interested in willing and investing in uh, uh, improvements in energy efficiency, even doing the work themselves. I know people at a co-op who, you know, it's like, yeah, we're going to spend a whole weekend spraying foam in the attic. And, you know, I'm only going to be here a couple of years and yeah, it'll save me a little on my bills, but like, isn't that cool? Um, and so I think it, there's definitely more incentive with housing co-ops to make those longer term investments. Um, especially if you amortize the costs through a loan, people might be saving uh, monthly from day one, they can they can benefit from that. Um, the other side of that, uh, to and or compared to other social housing and other types of things in the U.S., there's loan programs which might be a 10-year loan that the government does to pro produce affordable housing. The people who design and operate that as like an affordable housing agency that's not resident controlled, um, they're only thinking 10 years out. Um, maybe they're thinking longer, but oftentimes at 10 years, like they've done what they need to do, they got their pat on the back, they got paid, and then move on. And so a lot of the like new affordable housing that gets developed isn't actually built to last very well in a way that a co-op has a longer time horizon. Um, the other interesting thing that happens with co-ops is that sweat equity component, especially with young people who might have time, skills, and ability, but their opportunity costs are lower, maybe because they don't have full-time employment. Doing stuff like weatherization uh, is a way to buy older housing stock that's less expensive and improve its quality with your own work and in a way where the community is coming together. Um, so that's that's definitely been a popular thing for people to yeah buy some of these old drafty wooden Victorian houses and be like, all right, let's put in new windows, let's 
just, you know, you get the blower door technology and you can find where all the air leaks are. And it, it's some kind of like labor intensive stuff, but it's also a, a way to, you know, build community in your own house and be warmer in the winter, if that's the part of the country. You're in. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I guess this doesn't speak directly to the question that was asked, but I think it's a it's a big issue. This this question about um, quality, and I think um, the angle that I'll I'll take in, in discussing it is thinking about the way that policy um, and and kind of society more broadly um, kind of pushes home ownership um, as as the ideal, and and so what what results is you know okay, I can't buy a uh, traditional white picket fence. A single family house uh, in the suburbs, so maybe i'll I'll buy a, a condominium instead, right? and And these condominium towers that are you know hastily thrown together, for example, um, if you know if problems do arise because of the the hasty construction, right, the the value of that unit doesn't increase the same way it, it would for a, a well constructed unit that is able to maintain its value over time. So by, by uh, pushing home ownership kind of more broadly, we're pushing people into, into kind of buying into these types of units that maybe they shouldn't buy into in the first place. And maybe, um, you know, co-ops co obviously, as, as Corgan have, has uh, explained, offer some advantages for addressing that problem. But I think even um, looking at conventional renting compared to condos, right? Like the owner of a rental building has a certain incentive to preserve the value of, of the building as a whole. Um, whereas in, in a, a condo, there isn't the same incentive to preserve the value of the entire development. All right, I'm gonna leave some room for anyone else to ask questions, give them some time. We have one that just came in from Sarah Jensen to all the presenters. What is your opinion on how the national housing strategy will impact future development of affordable housing development, particularly co-op housing development? And um, just to jump in, I'm presuming this refers to the to Canada's new national housing strategy. Yeah, I mean, I'm not um, entirely well versed in the national housing strategy, um, so I'm not sure I can can adequately address that question, but. Um, from, from what I do know is um, a lot of advocates for affordable housing um, would say that it, it doesn't um, nearly go far enough, that we need um, kind of drastically, to, to drastically increase the amount of funding for things like social housing and, um, and, and for cooperatives and um, alternative tenures. <clears throat> And these kinds of things, and um, but the sense sense that I'm getting from talking to people who who know more about it than I do is is that it doesn't it doesn't nearly go far enough. It's a great start in the fact that this is the first time in in a really long time that we've had a federal level housing strategy. That's great. That's a, a really important step, but it's not uh, a big enough step. I think the part that's exciting about um, the fact, that, like you're saying, uh, in terms of the cohesiveness and having a national strategy that's cohesive, perhaps across provinces, and that um, responds to the needs of different regions. Um, an exciting piece around that is that I think now we're seeing, um, as cities are, are as we're seeing more urbanization, and, and cities increasing in population, 
um, and also cities being pitted with a lot of challenges that have traditionally been um, addressed and um, taken on by different levels of government. Um, it's good to see and very positive to see that there are opportunities for alignment across all three levels of government. Um, and so this strategy um, um, is a great step in the in that direction. But of course, as with any strategy and similarly with the Vancouver housing strategy, um, it's something that we are cautiously optimistic about, I think, because we don't really know how it plays out on the ground and how big of a dent it has until it's being implemented and until there are actual steps that are being taken. Um, and I think that's a huge piece that will also play into the effectiveness of the strategy is the uh, provincial level support. And I know right now we're waiting on on seeing how the pro our province will be responding in terms of the funding that it will be providing to different um, to, to the provincial housing strategy, and that, that's kind of a huge question mark right now, and how and how that'll actually play out on a um, subsequently on a municipal level. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know too much about the strategy, and most of the development work that I've worked with has been in the U.S. But um, I know the Ontario student co-ops have been keeping a keen eye on whether uh, new federal lending programs would, would be coming back online. Um, and, you know, there is a demand for, for starting new co-ops, um, as well as uh, interest in, in like refinancing and renovating some of the student co-ops that were built 30 or 40 years ago when there was a lot of money for this and then uh, the, the financing dried up. Um, I also know we've been, there's a group in Montreal uh, that is, building a new 160 unit um, or 160 bed student housing co-op. And uh, in Quebec anyway, there's lots of different sources of social housing money and co-op sector stuff going on. Um, so they they were able to pull a grant from the city and um, you know, a different, slightly different scene there, um, that, that sort of thing happening. One thing I thought was interesting, just kind of scanning the website quickly is to see what it actually looks like in practice to uh, focusing on on people with the highest need first. Um, talking about women, children, clean family violence, seniors, indigenous people, people with disabilities, mental health and addiction issues, veterans, and young adults tagged in there. So does this just mean priority or preference for who's able to get into housing developed through the thing? Is this involve some actual design and planning work around the needs of those different groups of people um, that's specific to their needs versus just like, oh, here's a bunch more housing and you guys get to go to the front of the line. Um, so I think that that could be something that would be interesting to see if, if those groups are able to have a seat at the table and saying this is this is the type of housing we need and this is where we need, need it. Um, and I think one of the other main things that come up of whether government programs actually help something like cooperative housing uh, is how whether the money is really coming out as a developer subsidy or whether the money is coming more towards the demand side. Um, if it's a developer subsidy, then the, there's people who there's developers who stand to profit from that, even if it's a non profit developer type thing. And it's the people who have the biggest scale connections and speed to get in and get in on those programs and uh, kind of pitch themselves to the government agencies as, as the go-to sources. And cooperatives are often not the quickest version of that because it is a slower community-led process usually in some, in some fashion. Um, but there are ways of specifically structuring programs to be more useful to co-ops or to, to give that incentive. Um, so see if that uh, is part of what shakes out. Great. I think we have time for just one more question before we close off and do some next steps. All right, we have a comment um, that came in from Anna. Um, governments have a strategy and providing resources is one thing. The co-op housing sector acting on them and leveraging existing resources is equally important. Definitely.
All right, are there any more questions? I don't want to cut off anybody who's typing away. Um, great, well, I think we can just go ahead and move to the next slide. If you, don't, if you do have more questions, um, kind of ties in here. We would love to hear any feedback or any more questions from you. Um, after this is over, Chris will be sending you a recording of this webinar, as well as our contact information for all the speakers, um, if you'd like to follow up with them. Um, in addition, we're also um, kind of throwing it out there if this, you thought this went really well and you're interested in learning more or having a, like a second webinar or more of them, um, please do let us know because that is something that we would be happy to collaborate more on later. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. If anybody else has any final thoughts, feel free to chime in. Um, but again, we wanna thank all of our speakers today, Nick, Veronica, Tessica, and Corrigan for taking your time out of your day before dinner um, and everyone for joining us today. And Chris as well, sorry, you don't see Chris, but he's put a lot of work into organizing this. Yeah, thank you so much for narrating and for organizing this. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you both for putting this together. Great. Well, have a great evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, and from uh, us folks at UNMGCY, thanks everyone for attending and have a great night.